dated? How do you even make friends as an adult? Are, are we adults? We'll fact check that later. <laughs> hey, yo, we are here for episode two. I am Amy and I am here with Rachel. And today we are going to do something fun. So our goal here on this podcast is to sort of broach a friendship friendship after the two of us working together professionally for um, a little while. And we thought that it might be fun to just collect a whole bunch of random questions. Like what are the rules of being friends? What do we need to know um, in order to sort of take our relationship um, in a new direction? And so I think today we are going to try and pull a couple of these questions. We encourage you to uh, like ask these questions to your friends as well. Um, Hopefully you find some of them interesting or they bring up some cool stories and maybe you're curious about sort of getting these stories out of your crew as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Miss Rachel and she's going to draw our question for today. I have like this jar of chaos. Um, (laughs) We call it that in Eagle Label now. It's probably (laughs) the jar of chaos. It's true. Because originally, when we were trying to think of like topics, what we would talk about, I just started. Um, I started being like, you know, I started with your favorite color. We joke about that, but I really did start with like favorite color. And then I was like, favorites are fun, but you know, it's more fun. What everybody hates. (laughs) Why we're friends though. (laughs) You know, what's more interesting? Why you hate something. (laughs) So, so then I was like, I'm just going to make this list of topics and we can do like favorite, least favorite or like love, hate. And then I was like, well, just because we like it or don't like it, we might have an unbiased opinion of like what thing though is actually the best or worst. And so I thought, oh, well, we'll just pick a topic and we'll like go through all four of those things. But then we started like, now we have more than just like those things in here. And I um, I pretended originally to put like more of the the real stuff toward the bottom and like the superfluous stuff toward the top but it is there's actually no anything could happen now it I mean truly anything could happen and so (laughs) I mean you're not sure if you're gonna get something fun or like our deepest darkest secret (laughs) it really I mean it's pretty hit or miss at this point so um so yeah I feel a lot of pressure about pulling one of these because like I'm if you're okay. an intuitive and you can't like decide what yeah, I'm going to pull then whatever the one is on the top and is closest to the right edge. That's the one I'm pulling. Oh, did it help? <laughs> we'll find out in a second. <laughs> oh, this is like kind of deep, but it doesn't have to be. So this is, what does it mean to be creative? Oh, Cause you know, I just started that like inner circle. Um, well, I started with my inner circle. We have like a, a small group of women that meet once a month to make sure that we've created time to be creative. Um, some of us, because we are creatives in our personal life. And I believe that if you do a creative job, it's very, very important for you to have a creative thing that has nothing to do with your job um, outside of that, because otherwise you don't create any flow of creativity. You are just putting into a machine instead of actually having any of that creative flow. So, or some people don't have a creative job and because they don't, they need a space to be doing that. Um, And so I, that must be, I don't know. I don't remember who of us decided. Was that you? (laughs) I I, I was like, this doesn't feel like I asked this question, but that, so I'll let you go first then. Cause if it's your question, you might, because I'm going to assume you're just like me. If it's your question, you probably already have a good answer. I mean, that's assuming a lot. Um, I just thought it would be funny to ask you. Um, but yes, like, what does it mean to be creative? Like, I think that that. I think it depends on who you are as a person and sort of your belief system around what is creating. Like I am a creator, like for how we use that term in society, I run a website, I'm constantly writing articles, I create new recipes, I create images and I create like 
I don't know, videos and things like that for Instagram and TikTok and things like that. I'm creating all the time. But when you suggested that I join your creative space, my immediate thought was, well, I never create, I never have time to create things, even though I create things all day, every day. I'm actually kind of burned out on creativity. Um, but I remember when, I remember when you asked the, like, as you were asking me if I wanted to come, like you were still in the process of being like, here's what it is. And are you interested? I was already on Amazon ordering a paint by numbers. <laughs> <laughs> I hadn't even said yes yet. I was like, I had, I'm going to be polite and wait until she gets to the end. But I'm like, cruising around on it. I'm like, oh, like this, maybe this one, maybe mm, I don't know. I mean, this one seems pretty cool. Um, and it was because I used to do a ton of paint by numbers. Um, when I was in high school and university, I used to do them too relax in between exams because it was something that took my whole focus and I could just kind of fall into this space where this is the only thing that exists and I'm going to set a timer and your only goal is to just fill in the colors and the order right the rigidity of this color goes in this place in this shape don't mess it up yeah it's so calming to me um, because like I said, I, I create all the time. So having something where I get to feel creative and I get to use lots of colors and I get to build a skill and be really mindful and intentional about how this thing is being creative feels like a different kind of creativity to me than all of the other things that I amass throughout the week. This right. sort of lets my brain unwind. And I remember when we were talking about it, when we started the group and I was kind of like chuckling, like, oh, like I wrote to paint my numbers. Everybody else is going to paint stuff from scratch and I'm sure I'm going to paint my numbers. Um, but there was something to be said about being able to create without an expectation. There was something to, you know, there's something really appealing about I'm going to make this thing and it's going to look good because an actual artist told me if you put this dot here, it's going to look spec like just trust me on this. So I got to go in sort of with faith that I'm going to make something and it's going to be beautiful, but also I get to relax and there's no expectation. I don't have to make anything like I don't have to make decisions about where are these colors going to go? What color is this going to be? you know, where are the highlights and the shades? Like I'm capable of thinking about those things I mean, it wouldn't look the same, but I make decisions all the time. And so there was something to be said for just showing up and just letting it sort of happen with no expectation and no rules and no, like, I don't care if I actually finish it or not. Like, that's not the point. The point is to sit and put colors on things. And that just felt so nice. Like, like everything else has like deadlines and all these things. It's almost like this creativity has become this really oppressive job that I have. And like, I hate mm -hmm. talking about what I do that way because I love what I do. But when it's every minute of every day is trying to put things out for people to consume, it really just does feel very mechanical after a while. And so having a place to kind of just unravel and unwind and have no expectations and have no one like coming and grading, like no one gets to have an opinion on this thing that I'm doing alone in my office. Like, throw it out no one's gonna know um and so I think that's where that question came from is like what is creativity if I do creative things all the time and they don't feel creative and this one thing that I'm not really creating anything is the most creative thing I've done in a while like what does that mean about the world if that makes yeah. sense well and the fact that you having to create also has an expectation of it needing to be a certain quality right whereas like if you can't tell that that thing is a, you know, barn when you're done or a flower or a fish or whatever, like, so what if you, who cares? <laughs> you know, like it impacts my income, like it doesn't impact my life. Right. There's nothing really riding on what this thing looks like at the end right. um, versus like my job, like, and there's something to be said about putting your creations online at all times. Like, I can't tell you the amount of nasty comments that I get about nothing. Like I posted something once that was meant to be really funny. Um, it was just like a, like, look, I, I experienced this too. Here's a funny, relatable, like five second video of just me. It was funny. It was funny. <laughs> um, but somebody commented, this is annoying and adds no value. And at the time I've grown a little bit since then. I was at a point in my business where I was like, oh, like we don't respond to those comments. Like we take the high road, like I just get rid of it. Um, but it's sort of like eating at my soul, not responding to these things, like just letting people walk into my space and be really rude to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I replied, you know what else is annoying and adds no value? I'm just kind of like, that felt creative. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, first of all, <laughs> Uh, hmm. Also, like, 
I totally would have been on that with you too. And that's, I also am like, I like, you know, there's kind of this collective understanding that it's on the internet and you put it there so that you opened yourself up to having that. So like, you just have to suck it up and deal with it regardless. And I definitely feel like every space that is mine that's on the internet is my space. So like, if I would, if you came into my home and I had invited pieces of my community to be in my home with me and you walked in and were like, mm-hmm, I, w- I would not be like, just turn to the other person and start talking to them and ignore you. I'd be like, oh yeah. So actually this is my home and these are my people. And while they're invited into my home and space, we don't actually get to come in and speak to people like that here. And I'm loving watching people set boundaries on their spaces Mm -hmm. and that we're kind of in a, an age right now where your number of followers or whatever is not necessarily impacting people the same way that that used to impact people where you were like, if I don't have 400,000 followers, I can't be successful. Like, no, you can make a decent income and have like 1500 followers. And actually the people that have more intimate followings, I mean, 1500 people isn't intimate, but like people who have more intimate, I mean, you do not have an intimate amount of followers. Like you, I have, a, I have an incredibly intimate amount of followers. You do not, but like, you don't have 2 million followers, you know, some people do, but I find that every time I watch a person leave, I'm like, wow, that like, I can actually feel the energy and the breath of air leave because now this more authentically aligns back with my people that are actually here. Oh, excellent. You should go find a different place to be. So, but I mean, you definitely, you create, create, and you put all of your stuff out constantly. And I think it's really creative to think of what do you need that you're not getting from that creativity? What do you need to make and put out in the world that you're not making and putting out into the world in that space? And what do you need to put into you Mm. and to realize that what you need is like something that doesn't take up your mental space and that can just be fun with no outcome oriented thought process, which is like a whole thing for you and I, like, to, <laughs> like when you, when you said that you're not getting a grade, I was like, <gasps> you know, just okay. <laughs> but yeah. And I think, um, I love that question because I think people don't give themselves credit for being creative in spaces that don't look creative. And um, I mean, there definitely was a time in my life where if somebody had said to me, oh, who are your creative friends? I would have named artists, musicians, actors. Um, I would not have named like- A poop specialist? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, I definitely wouldn't have named some of some of the people that now I would name. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because now creativity means for me, like putting putting something together or like creating a thing that before you did not exist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that's out of nothing right? It's just out of my own ingenuity. I put this idea together and that was really creative or it's, I take a bunch of things and I put them together in a way nobody else has thought to put them together or I change one like very weird thing. And so I think the creativity for me is, are you doing something that's out of the box? Mm. And I think for you, like you doing a paint by number is thinking out of the box because you would normally not think to look at something that didn't have a perceived outcome or wasn't adding value in some way or was just fun. We might find just fun things, superfluous or not, you know, and we need that. 100%. We need- 
goal driven. Like I run on gold stars, gold right. stars and coffee. Like that's <laughs> name of the game. <laughs> right. So yeah, yeah, you're absolutely right. Sitting down with something that has absolutely no purpose is so foreign and scary. Like it's scary doing this paint by numbers. I'm like actively avoiding it. And it's because it just freaks me out that like, what is like, it just feels so weird that it yeah, has yeah. no purpose or goal or whatever. And I know that that's the fun and it really does help me unwind when I like can get to it. Um, yeah, yeah. But I think that it's interesting talking about like having what creativity means change over time. Like I also consider problem solving a huge yes. part of creativity. Like my dad is a mechanic. Um, he's a teacher now. He used to work on like the big Mack trucks and they mm. were the weirdest problems and need to go out the next morning. And he is one of the most creative people I know. You hand him any kind of gear or machine or tool, like he can make anything out of them. You come to him with the weirdest problems and he's like, oh, like follow me to the garage and like it's fixed. Like I've walked in with the weirdest stuff, no notice. And he's like, oh, like I don't know, like <laughs> let's go. Like we're going to figure it out. And I think that like, I know I inherited his mind, like very mechanical. I need to know how it works. Um, but it does strike me as a very interesting form of creativity. Just how do I take these things that don't and kind of make them do? Right. How do, I, how do I get from A to B? If that makes absolutely no sense, like it still has to work at the end of the day, like, let's go. This is awesome. Right. Because there are people that are in traditionally creative spaces who are not creative at all. Mm -hmm. right? Like mm -hmm. I know people, well, just myself growing up, right? Like the instrument that I played was, I was very classically trained. And then I went to this music institute at Hartwick College, um, a kind of like near upstate New York, where my grand, near where my grandparents were, where I had originally been born. And um, they they have uh, all, I mean, everybody that plays all kinds of things comes, but they also had like a couple art classes. And I remember I had auditioned and I had accidentally gotten into this one group, which I was, I was not prepared to be in. I had a very good audition piece mm -hmm. and not like the to back it up in every space. And I had never played in an orchestra before because I had, grown up in a teeny tiny town we had a band and chorus a band a core like there was not lots not of different things in orchestra <laughs> right like I had never actually played my flute with a stringed instrument before and so I ended up in this group that like I didn't belong in but because I had accidentally ended up in these groups I didn't belong in I also ended up in a vocal jazz group and I remember being literally physically ill every single morning that I had to go to group because I knew we were going to have to scat. And I literally, I didn't understand it. It didn't make sense to me. Nobody could tell me whether I was right or wrong, but I was pretty sure by the responses that some of the things were right and some of the things were wrong, but I had no like checklist of way to know about that. Mm -hmm. And also like, there was a, a particular person that I grew up with and they could really play their instrument. And there was like Zippo personality in any of it. And then because I grew up outside of New York and I kind of had this beautiful, like be in the woods, introverted, whatever. And then I could go into the city quite easily to hear somebody playing in the subway and to be like, I I know people who are professional musicians who could never do that. Mm -hmm. And to think not to say that you're not creative if you understand how the things go together, but like, I find that to be, you're really good at math. If you can put music yeah. together more than that, you're so creative. Like my son writes music and I'm like, that's cute. How you heard that in your head. I have I have no understanding of how you got there, but I come from a line of, musicians and kind of like creative people so it's interesting now to see like I would consider some architects that I've met to be a creative over some actors that I've met who like x plus y equals z every time and you're never going to get anything new or interesting out of them and I just find that to be so weird but when 
originally when I read this question, I actually do remember now you sent like you sending this to me. <laughs> Instagramming it to you at three. Yeah, I yeah. <laughs> what is she on? <laughs> Which means that I saw it at like 7 a.m. like this. Um, because you're one of you're one of the people whose things are safe to open in the morning. <laughs> um the very, very first thing that came to mind is um, I love the movie Mona Lisa Smile with Julia Roberts. Um, and at the very end, um, F you if you think this is a spoiler alert, because this movie is like. Very old. I feel like it's past the spoiler alert. Like, yeah, like it's too late for you. Also, let me tell you the end of like Dirty Dancing. <laughs> They dance, uh, oh. dirty. <laughs> um, but at the very end, all of her students bring her a paint by number, but they're all painted different colors. So like they put, um, you know, like some of them are like all different shades of blue and, and you look at them and you know that underneath they were all the exact same thing, right? They were like Van Gogh's form phase of flowers or whatever but not only can you pick out like some of the characters and which one is probably theirs like you can tell why there's that connection there but it I mean I have a lot of feminist like connection to that movie anyway but it's so fun to see all the women show up in this space that they're like um this is the cookie cutter we were all given. Mm -hmm. um, and now this woman has given us permission to like, we can't, we can't necessarily make a new cookie cutter yet, but like we're all allowed to show up with our cookie cutter however we want to. And I just like that to me is creativity, giving yourself permission to like, do something that maybe somebody thought you shouldn't do or that's surprising. And I picked up watercolors um, during the Coco Roro. And um, my, my grandfather's like mother and sisters were all very specific women. And um like one of my, whatever that makes them, my great, great aunts. I don't, yes, my great, great aunts, I think. Um, like one of them went through Europe and, uh, and painted. And one of them like went to Italy and played piano before women like went and traveled places without having a chaperone and, you know, and, and did something that, was them and put themselves into the world instead of like getting married and you know whatever everybody else was doing and even my grandfather's mother ran like the one room schoolhouse and she was still not like a part of the cookie cutter either even though she maybe looked the most yep. of that and I've always wanted to be able to do art and I am so uh, results driven. If I have something in my head and I can't make the thing that looks like that, then it's a failure, right? So I decided to choose the painting thing that you can control least. <laughs> Cause like if, if your paper is wet and you put the thing in, it's going where it's going. Like you can't always control what's going to happen. Yeah. And it has brought a lot of freedom into, i I can be mindless when I do it because I have no control over it anyway. And that's a, that's a pretty seriously deep life lesson. Like that's a lot. So I love this question. Thank you. Do you have more thought? Let me, let me just like play with the piece of paper. If I'm here like this, it's because I'm like refolding the piece of paper and unfolding it again. Cause I can't stop with my hands. Do you have more thoughts or do you want to pick Let's pick another one. A new bizarre thing. Do you have more thoughts about where I should? <laughs> um... <laughs> okay, it's too late. I have one for better or worse. And it's not one word. So I really don't know what's going on. But this one you definitely sent. Okay. Um, thoughts on resting bitch face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was me. <laughs> 
I really need to know what the impetus behind this was. Like, I need to know why that was a thing. Um, okay, so for, so I get accused of having resting bitch face all the time, and I don't know why. It, can, it does not even occur to me how that could possibly be true. Um, like, I live in Toronto, and so it's all like, oh, like, you should smile more, and like, me trying not to like, throat punch people, because um, not one time has that ever made me want to smile. Like, if you're a, if you're a person who does that, and you were listening, stop it. We don't like it. Um, but one of my favorite things about Coco Roa was I got to wear a mask. Yes. And it's been like over two years of just bliss where my face is just my face. And I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed it. And now that the masks are off, I'm a little worried that we're all going to have to go back there. And now I've lost the tolerance and I will throw a punch somebody. I don't want to go to jail because you don't know boundaries. That's so stupid. Like, this is just my face. It's just my face. Um, that's just how I look, but thanks for noticing. Yeah. Like things like, I remember one time I was, I really like audiobooks cause I like walking everywhere where one car family, my husband always has the car. Um, and so I'm very good at navigating like our transit system. I walk like my cap for like, do I need to take transit or is it too far to walk is 45 minutes. Mm-hmm. I wear holes in all my shoes. I cannot get enough walking. I love it. Um, and so I do a lot of audiobooks, especially when I'm marathon training, um, mm-hmm. because it's like hours and hours, like you don't have to remember to like re-download a bunch of podcasts or something. Yes. Um, and one time I was waiting to go in to some appointment and I was listening to this book and the woman in the book was having a miscarriage and I had invested like hours in this thing. And it was like, Oh my gosh. And I was like feeling it in my feels. And I was like, you are in public and you need to like get it together because like, this is about to be ugly. Um, and some dude walked by and was like, you should smile. You'd be so much prettier. And I was like, you're all right, go, you're right now. I am having an emotional thing right now. You need to go away from me right now. Like I gave him cut eye. Like I didn't know I was capable of giving that to a person I didn't know. Like the level of rage that came out of my eyes was like superhuman. And he like scooted off. But like ever since then, I've been like, this is my face and you need to back off my face. And so I was curious, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, um, I generally speaking, really embrace a word that is supposed to be derogatory for women and is like generally only used to derogatorily describe or deal with women. So I am like, oh, like I could interpret this a whole bunch of different ways. Um, But as somebody whose face is always going to tell you exactly what I'm thinking, my face is rarely resting. Um, <laughs> it's, um, my face is usually just saying the things like I definitely have an I'll cut a bitch face, like an I'll shank you face. Um, but as a kid growing up, I had a lot of stuff and like, I used to make a very specific face about not being happy about things, which is like, and so Rachel making a face. I have. Oh yeah. <laughs> Listen. And so <laughs> I'm sorry. Could you not hear my face? <laughs> that feels, that feels sketchy. Um, I feel like people probably could hear my face, but, um, I made that face a lot and that was brought up <laughs> quite a bit while I was growing up. And so, um, I would just, I would just like there to not be a comment about how people look Mm -hmm. (laughs) because you really, not only don't you ever know what somebody's going through, because generally when I'm listening to a podcast, I'm listening to something um, that now I'm going to label something creative that's like stereotypically creative, but like I'm listening to some sort of creative podcast and, or I'm uh, working on uh, like my script for my acting class the next time. So like my face is never resting. I'm always going through a line in my head or like I'm reacting like as if I'm saying something with my face. So I'm sure people are just like, what is wrong with that poor woman (laughs) most of the time? But 
you know, my justice seeking heart of like equality and everybody just being able to be. And because we, we actually don't necessarily know what people's faces physically have gone through or because we don't really know what extenuating circumstance somebody's body has I would just love there I would love that when you say resting bitch face nobody actually has ever heard of it before and you don't really know what it is because I would just like there to not be stereotypical trending comments about what anybody looks like so yeah now that I've now that I've been a real downer about things should I pick another one do it Debbie (laughs) oh yeah (laughs) Okay, I just picked the one that wasn't calling to me instead. So I'm going to go back to the one that was. All right, fair. Oh, I just put this one in. Have you ever asked somebody for an autograph? Did you, wait, no, you made have did, no, I don't know. I that really came out of my actual head. Okay, <laughs> okay. Did Have you ever asked somebody for an autograph? Not specifically, but I have been offered two very interesting autographs. Um, so don't tell my husband this first story is about my ex-boyfriend, um, who is like my almost husband before my husband. Um, and he used to run, like, he could still do it. I don't know. I don't really creep him. Um, but he and his friend ran like a website where they would like, they were like media so they could get into all these shows and interview, um, like some really big people um and we like I got to go with him because my job was to keep the time because they had like agreed to a certain length of interview and so with him I met Trent Trent Reznor Mm -hmm. who signed a CD for me and I met Tom Morello who signed the CD for me um and then my I was gonna say current husband he's my only husband (laughs) oh okay my current husband boyfriend not Um, cycling through those got it all right um he's an entertainment lighting designer and so he like travels with a lot of bands and when I met him he was touring the theory of a dead man and like let me tell you they are so sassy on stage they are the biggest gentlemen they like hold doors for you offer you snacks it's like crazy um you would never guess seeing them on stage but they're like the nicest people don't tell them that I said that because it'll ruin their image they work so hard on that um but one time we were um they were like going to Sarnia or something. It was the first like overnight thing that my husband and I had ever done together. Um, and so we went to Sarnia um, and like they gave me like a shirt and they gave me a CD and they all signed it. And so I think that's my favorite autograph, even though technically I didn't ask for any of them. I love you? that. That's so cool. Um, so you know that I'm a big theater nerd. And so like I do... Um, I I hit a point in my life where I realized that I was very unhappy. And I realized that part of that was because I wasn't participating in anything that brought me joy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, that's it. I have to make sure that I'm going home at least, you know, one time a year. And then we moved back to the East coast. So that was actually feasible. So I do go back home. I go up to the city. I'm not from the city. Um, I, I like to say I'm a New Yorker. I'm from New York, the state, not the city, but like, I didn't know growing up that they would stage door after shows. So like often many of the people that were just in the show will come out the stage door and that people would stand and wait with their playbills to get autographs. That wasn't something my parents would never have like been people who would have thought we needed to go fight a maddening crowd to go stand in a line to maybe have somebody whatever and then um I too was um I had a person briefly in college and um speaking of resting bitch face and I um and we went to see Jekyll and Hyde and we went to the stage door and I think we actually might have gone like when they knew some of the people would maybe be arriving for work and then we stayed after and he I remember him having his playbill and like getting it signed and him being like do you want 
do you want your, and I was like, no, because I thought it was so rude. These people just ran a marathon. Are you freaking kidding me? They all have to come out and be nice and act like they want to see each individual face. They were on stage for a reason. They might not even be comfortable one-on-one talking with people. They might just be people that are okay being on stage. I was so, I was so like, (laughs) I was so like, oh my God, I was so embarrassed. I was mortified. And, um, and then I, I don't even remember kind of how that changed for me, but, um, we went to see bandstand, my husband and I, my current husband and I went to see bandstand, um, especially as military family. And, uh, everybody was so gracious, but there had been, because I'm the person who's always prepared because I, I am, I'm happy to be needed. When we were at intermission, I had gone down to the restroom and, um, I always carry a needle and thread and like safety pins in my purse. And this, this poor girl, she was probably maybe 18, 19, 20. And she had these, like, I mean, she was just like, so tall and like just like you but know I'm so tall because you are that, not tall <laughs> that kind of, I am not I'm not any tall and so <laughs> I'm zero tall um but she just had like she had the outfit on that I wish my body could wear but like I'm okay in the body that I have now we've done a lot of work for that too but she had on these like really cool high-waisted black pants and the entire zipper had broken and she was like holding her pants together but the pants were so high if the zipper was literally like it had to have been 16 inches long I mean it was like all of her pants right like now she's just not wearing pants she was wearing a lot of pants now she's wearing no pants like it was a thing and I remember I so I like took all of the safety pins out of my purse and I handed them to her and she's like oh my gosh thank you and she like safety pinned her whole pants up so fast forward we're at the stage door now and we had gone to see my fair lady like I don't remember if that was before or after but like now my husband thinks he's a theater person too it's kind of funny because okay sir but (laughs) we literally go out and um like Brandon Ellis came out and like Joe Carroll came out and then um and and they were all signing everything and I my husband and I are literally where they come out right against the railing like perfect place for people to sign our stuff and this girl and her three friends literally they just like shove in front of me And my husband was like, oh, mm, no, like, mm, no. And I was like, and also, ma'am, you would be not wearing pants in New York City right now if it wasn't for me. And it's very likely that you and your friends came from afar on a train or a bus this morning. And you're not even like can chat, you know, jet back to your, excuse me. And even I was just like, are you serious? Like, is is this real life? And also, I'm a whole adult. Like, how dare you? Like, please don't push the elderly out of the way. And so my husband was like, no. And he just, he's not a tall man either, but he's not, he's not as not tall as I am. And he just like put his arm with my playbill out between them. And then um, like Laura Osnes and Corey Cott came out and they were kind of the leads. And, you know, my, my husband was like, that it was very cool to see like our stories somewhere, you know, people, people watch movies of like, somebody comes to your door in your uniform and you watch people crumble. And like, that's what you see of that. But to not, to not really know how people live with that in their bodies every day, it was very cool to see that. And plus we just love that era of music and whatever. And so we got all, I have all of the original Broadway cast on my playbill and that is like very near and dear to my heart because they were also so gracious like when he said that 
Corey stopped and like chatted with him for a couple minutes. And I was like, you have this whole like fan base of young girls who are delusional about how old you are and how old they are. And they're like waiting for you to sign their stuff. Right. And like, that was so gracious and lovely and just whatever. And then we went to see my fair lady and, you know, sometimes you go to a show and people are out, like they just are. And we, when you're a theater goer, you kind of joke about like, you don't want to come in and have there be like an extra piece of paper stuck in your playbill. Cause that means it's going to have a piece of paper. That's like tonight, the role of whoever will be played by this person. And I always think about like, I'm sorry, the person who is about to play this person is on Broadway. Like they're probably all right, you know? And so like, okay, you go to see a person, but like how awful to go and have, and have, have them like announce like tonight, the role of whoever will be playing and hear like a simultaneous, like 1500 people groan, like, well, I'm very excited and feel capable now to come out and entertain you. And so we had lived um, in Washington state when a couple of shows came out that I really wanted to see one of them being the show catch me if you can, um, because I love Norbert Leo Butts, and he was playing um, like the drunk father in my fair lady. And he, he was literally the reason we put our bodies onto an airplane flew across pieces of our country landed and went to this show and we get there and he's not, he's not there that night. And like, I was in such a state of like, I didn't even have a feeling. I was just like, (laughs) and so, um, the per- so then we we stage doored and because it was kind of like an old person show there were very few people so the people came out and like had whole conversations with us and blah 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 like it was so lovely like everybody just kind of had chats with everybody um including the person that played his role but one of the older women in the show had been in game of thrones Whoa. and so lots like lots of actors come out and they just like you know past everybody they are not stopping to sign everything and p.s it's not their job right so like everybody who bitches about the people who don't stop like I hate to let you know when we did this and then that was the end of their job Mm -hmm. um they're back to real people I don't know if you can tell because they're not wearing a costume now so now they're not they're not doing their job now. And so um, the person who had played the female lead came out and she had kind of like made a beeline for the situation. And I heard like some teeny boppers kind of next to me. And I, then I gently explained to them how, when they, and the curtain, that that was the end of her job for the night. And also, did you watch the woman sing seven minutes worth of a song while she ran up and down a rotating flight of stairs? Like, are you stupid? People who probably bitched about the four blocks you had to walk to get here tonight. But so this woman who had been in Game of Thrones comes out and she has her like security person, right? And she is like, going to her limo and my husband is like getting in the limo with her like I don't know who she is we've watched Game of Thrones I'm still in the phase of like we're on season four of Game of Thrones and I still have to be like who is that who are they related to why are they here who did who did they die like I don't understand what's happening what clan of people are they a part of please explain it to me again and she signed only my husband's playbill because he asked, he went up and he was like, oh, Game of Thrones. And like, and she probably could smell on him that not a theater person and like took pity and signed it. Um, but generally speaking, I am the person in those situations with my playbill. And I'm like, oh, this 13 year old over here who just said next to me that they're from, you know, like Indiana, it's their first Broadway show and they're three people behind me. And I'm like shoving them in front of me so they can have like yeah. the experience. Cause I feel like I'm a grown ass person and I've had the experience, but I'm either doing that or I'm like in the middle of doing that. And the person comes and they have to be like, do you, do you want me to, to sign that? <laughs> we went to Moulin Rouge 
Danielle and I, my friend that I talked about in episode one, and I was literally like talking to somebody, like waving my thing and all the leads are coming out and they're like, individually, they're like, do you, would you like me to, were you here for a purpose (laughs) at all? Like, or, and it just doesn't occur to me because their job is over anyway, that, so I do have autographs. I don't know that I ever asked for any of them, except that I like showed up in the collective and they were like, I don't know if you know, but you're supposed to want my autograph. Um, (laughs) But here's a question that I'm, here's a question that I'm curious about. Um, How do you store all of these autographs? So I, I didn't know that like things were a thing and I, I have a hard time that, um, like everything is sentimental to me. Everything I can, I can attach a a moment to anything. And so like it, plus I am perfection driven. So like the fact that I don't have playbills from like the first time I went to a show to now makes it very hard for me to save things from now. But I did buy frames And they are all like in frames and they used to be in our music room. And then my son just took over the music room in such a way that I was never seeing them. And so that was ridiculous, but they are um, like, I have a few Moulin Rouge uh, playbills. I have a few of like other things that I've gone to see once or twice or, you know, whatever. And so um, I do have them like in fours in frames that will eventually be in my office when I have a more office-y office. <laughs> but I'm really bad at like even knowing what to do with them because I have friends that are less theater people than I am that have just like binders of because they sell them like specifically for playbills to put like that sized thing in but like having an album would drive me batshit crazy so there's no reason but yeah is yours in a special place like do you have it I don't have any of them I don't think anymore oh okay that makes me feel better about my life well and it's different because I wasn't there to see the person I was there as an right. adjunct to someone doing a job and so like I still have my picture of me and Tom Morello where yes. I, was, I was like oh no you don't have to do it. he was like here like we'll do a picture together I was like oh like we don't have to do that like I'm not associated I'm just keeping the time like I, I'm just yes here as, like a superfluous person and he was like no no and so like I still have my picture of me being like oh my god <laughs> like but that's yes really on Facebook. So I've like, done some <laughs> I've had done some like meet and greet things before a concert with people. And so I have a picture of me with those people, but in every circumstance, that person has also had to ask me if I would like their autograph. Like I have the thing that they have given me for the person to sign, like in my, and they're like, and a couple of them are the same people. So like, um, I went to see, uh, this one uh, Broadway actor, um, he grew up in a town very adjacent to mine. And so like, I knew of him growing up. Um, We were in high school at the same time. And it's been like such an affirmation to my soul of to just do what you want to and don't worry about the things that he has made it right I mean he was in a much larger school than I was so even if I knew he was going to make it at the time that wouldn't have said to me it's an okay thing to pursue because I was from a dinky tiny little place but like it definitely um, made it different for me when my son decided he wanted to be a music performance major for me to be like I think that's great and I have no feelings about that I have no worry about him making a living I have no nothing because you don't have to be famous to make a living but I've gone and seen um this person his name's Aaron Tivy and he um he's been on Broadway several times and then he also has like done a couple movies and some other TV things. And he did a series of concerts Mm -hmm. and I got to go, I think to three of them. And I did a meet and greet for two of them. And both times he had to ask me if I wanted his autograph. He had to be like, you know, the, like, basically like the thing you have around your neck, that I have signed for the other 30 people that were just ahead of you in line that would you like (laughs) 
And so <laughs> I just don't get it. Like, I just don't get it. I don't know. I'm not smart enough. I don't get it. My hair thing's going to fall out. I'm going to just deal with it. Here we are. Now we're going to have to deal with whatever happens, happens. We hope it's nothing too terrible. Everybody watching on YouTube is now going to wish they had listened to the podcast. Um, Chaos. So we deliver. So is this the end? I guess it is. Or are we doing another one or is this the end? Probably the end. We should probably end for later. Okay. So then we're just done. We're done then, right? Okay. Okay. Love you. Bye. Okay. So there is episode two. If you want to talk about any of these things with your friends, if you want to discuss these experiences yourself, drop them in the comments. If you're listening to the podcast, shoot us an email. We are so excited to get to know you guys too. We'll see you later.